Attention, the following video may contain fun, humor, profanity, personal opinions, political incorrectness, and so on. If you are under the age of 18 or are easily offended by something as simple as gendered words, then I suggest you turn this video off and watch something more suited to you. Something like Sesame Street. Don't say I didn't warn you. How dare you! G'day guys. Today's video is a bit of an important topic. Um, this is going to be a video on radio control helicopter maintenance. Um, primarily with nitro helicopters. Um, this video is mainly going to be uh, aimed towards the beginner, novice pilot, um, and I mean, and like I said, it's going to be primarily aimed at nitro powered helicopters. Um, some of, uh, the information and some of my tips will be relative to electric helicopters, but we'll be mainly focusing on nitro. Um, so this is something um, I've been thinking about doing um, the maintenance is an important uh, part for any uh, radio controlled model whether it be helicopters planes cars whatever um, and I know that uh, different pe uh, people will have different um, opinions and different methods of maintenance and honestly there's there's really no wrong maintenance except no maintenance so uh, what i'm going to do now is we're going to cut to the table and we're going to go from there all right guys so here we have my nitro helicopter it is a synergy n5c talk tube edition for those playing at home um if you if uh for those that are unaware talk tube basically instead of a belt driven tail rotor it is a shaft driven tail rotor uh so and it is obviously in nitro so this is an important subject or topic however you want to put it um maintenance is very important when it comes to especially when it comes to helicopters um, model helicopters you have depending on size and so forth you have two main blades and tail rotor essentially keeping it in the air and if something uh, were to fail it can prove to be uh, catastrophic also and I don't want to put people off if they're looking at getting into this hobby it can be dangerous too uh, you could cause injury to yourself or to others who may be watching or in in the immediate area so maintenance is important so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the canopy off and we will, I will go through with you what I do after every flying session. Okay, so we have the canopy off and what this, this maintenance that I do, I will do it after every time I come home from the flying field. Now, generally, I will fly, if I take this out to the flying field with me, I will probably have anything between two and four flights, uh, depending on how I feel, how many other models I have with me, and so forth. Now, um, for the record, I'm going to put this out here straight now, I'm not a 3D pilot. Um, 
and if you're unfamiliar with that term I basically I don't do aerobatics I I just fly around um, I mean I do do the occasional inverted flight but when it comes to doing things like TikToks and uh, pirouettes and things like that that's not my, my thing um, I'm not afraid to admit that my uh, my brain doesn't think fast enough to do stuff like that so I just fly around and I just enjoy flying the helicopter and that's just my style so I'm not very hard on my gear however if you are looking at getting into 3d flying uh, this is something routine maintenance whether it be just casual flying or 3d flying is a must especially if you do 3d because you are definitely a lot harder on the gear so when I come home from every flying session I'll bring it into my workshop here and I will go over it and check things over so what I'll do is first of all I will start with linkages now linkages so you have your ball ends and ball cups you have your rods you have the servo con like servo horns and what I will do is I will visually inspect them and also get a little hands-on so what I'll do is I will go twist them see if they bind give them a bit of pressure like so to see if they pop off um, because what you got to remember too especially with like your rotor head and your tail rotor well more so with the your main rotor um, as this is spinning you've got constant movement on especially with these linkages here not so much the uh, ones that control the swash plate but more so with like these ones here on on the rotor head as as it's spinning you've got movement so basically just to exaggerate it the, the ball is constantly moving around like that at a high rate of speed so it's doing that like those ball ends are moving around and so forth like that inside the uh, rod ends so there's a lot of wear on that and after a period of time it can uh, wear out so what I like to do is like to put a bit of pressure on it to see if there's any movement or if it pops out and um, that's all good so I will move down I will check all the other rod ends in a sec I should put that on silent so I'm not being disturbed okay where were we all right so I will go through all the rod ends again now these don't move as much as the ones on the main rotor but there is still they still move so I will check them and I'll do the same thing I'll put some pressure on there to see if they if it pops off which they aren't which is good um, I also check like uh, the cranks here see if there's any slop on in the bearings and that's all well and good and so forth and the reason why I check all the rod linkages is what you need to remember is the especially with a model that is fly barless mm -hmm. you have a lot of I guess you call it gyroscopic uh, energy and pressure going through these rods because what you got to remember is uh, with a fly barless unit well with a fly barless helicopter you have a fly barless unit so it gives it has it's a gyro stabilization system what it's doing is it's calculating so many cycles per second and so these servos are constantly having to move to correct the helicopter to keep it level if you're and to keep it moving and keep it smooth there's a lot of load put on these rod ends as it's flying especially like for instance when you're 
changing pitch and so forth. That's a lot of load traveling around through those rods. So you want to inspect the rods to make sure that you know, they're not bent, there's no wear in the plastic and so forth. And also check things like here, make sure there's no slop and that. So you want to make sure that these are fine and especially too with your uh, throttle linkage uh, you want to make sure that like for instance the uh, the little arm here on the carburetor the screw is tight that holds it on these are nice there's no binding there's no slop because I've seen it happen at the air, airfield, uh, one of the other club members uh, was flying his helicopter and this screw here came loose and he essentially had about three quarter throttle for the whole flight. So he couldn't idle down, he couldn't, um, well yeah, he had no throttle control. So he had to fly and at the time he had about half a tank so we had to fly around for about three quarter throttle for half a tank and um that was the longest 10 minutes ever <laughs> so yes you want to make sure everything is is uh secure is not loose is not too tight and so forth now the next part one of the next things I like to do too is check the rotor head, uh, especially the thrust bearings. Now the thrust bearings, how it works is obviously as you can see, this is what controls your pitch and your yaw and so forth. So what happens is you've got a rod in here and two bolts and a couple of bearings and two thrust bearings either side and the bolts clamp uh, screw down and that is what holds the blade grips to the main rotor head so what i like to do generally i'll do this um without the blades on but it's something you don't have to do with the blades off but um if any adjustment is required it's you need the blades off however um, what I do is I'll get the model and I'll move it back and forth. It's a bit hard to do it one-handed, but if you can imagine my left hand there, I will move it to see if there's any, uh, if these are loose, if there's any uh, lateral movement. If that's the case, that means that one of the screws has, or both the screws have come loose. And trust me guys, you do not want that to, to come loose because not only will um, it will put the blades out of balance because essentially one is longer than the other, but it would also make the model uncontrollable. So always make sure that there's no movement. And when you tighten them, you don't have to really crank down on it. You just want them fairly tight. And, and um, there, some some uh, models might have a torque setting, um, but I do it where it's fairly snug. But like I said, don't crank down on it because you can cause damage on the in, on the inside of the rotor head. Right. So now the next part. So I like to go over and check the electronics. So that e that includes the fly ballast unit the servos, the servo leads, and the battery. As well as, and now depending on the fly ballast unit setup you have, you might, like mine, I, I run a spectrum radio, so I have two spectrum satellites, so one here and one here. Um, the reason being is uh, with two satellites, I have one uh, aerial facing that way and the other aerial facing that way. That way you have like a, a 90 degree uh, setup, which basically covers both axes of um, uh, reception. Just gives you better reception, basically. Anyway, so what I like to do is, uh, ch first of all, 
with the nitro model you have um, the, a lot of vibration so I will check I use uh, Kyosho uh, vibration absorption gel on here so it's a you can't you can just see it there it's a very soft thick gel and as you can see there is a bit of movement and the, it doesn't flop about but what it does is it takes the vibration from the engine out so you don't get any interference or um, uh, out of control movement from the gyro because the gyro could be going like this I'm exaggerating it but just to give you an idea so that just takes the vibration out so I will check that to make sure that it is sticking well like I'll, I'll hold it by the case like so and I'll move it like that yep it's and it's lifting the model so that means it's stuck firmly also I will go over all the servos to make sure that you know there's no moot there's no binding and so forth yeah they all move smoothly obviously I've got uh, two servos on the other side one's another cyclic servo and the tail uh, rotor servo I will check them I'll also check to make sure for instance here I have some hot glue and the hot glue is to hold all the servo lead connectors inside it so it that they don't slide out again if you have something happen and it slides out it's going to prove catastrophic so that is something you want to keep an eye on another thing is with the servo leads you uh, in this case uh, this model has a carbon fiber frame so I will uh, check the servo leads to make sure that there's no um, wear on the leads because what can happen is the vibration can cause the rubbing on the lead and the insulation on the lead can wear away and if you didn't know carbon fiber is a electrical conductor and if you get a short well you're going to fry your electronics and you're going to crash so just check over these sort of things and as you can see here I need to put a little bit more on but um, when I got this model it came with this uh, rubber seal stuff to go around the outside frame here to hold the tank in well I had stuff left over some left over and like I've put some there and there and I've done it on the other side and what this does is it um, protects the uh, servo leads from rubbing up against the carbon fiber just something to prevent anything catastrophic from happening to the model as I say also with the battery because uh, I always unplug it after I finish flying for the day just check things like if there's any damage to the plug and same with the this is just a uh, uh, servo clip so it just holds the connectors together so they don't unplug during flight because again catastrophic damage so and I check I'll take the battery off it's velcroed on there and I've got two velcro straps I'll check things I'll do this off camp I, I, I've already done it but I'll, I'll check things to make sure that nothing's worn through the battery and I will make sure that it's all all a-okay all right the next part is pretty obvious um, what I do now is I will go over every single nut and bolt and I will make sure that it is tight and secure because again with a nitro model unlike their electric counterparts nitro models have a lot of vibration and with vibration over time nuts and bolts and screws can work their way loose so what i like to do as i said i go over every single screw 
and so forth. So, and on this model, uh, most of the hardware is uh, two millimeter and two and a half millimeter hardware. So we've got. So what I like to do is go over it and give it a turn. Give it a turn, and when I say give it a turn, it's not actually turning, but what I'm doing is I'm getting it and I'm putting a bit of load on the screw to see if there's any movement. Now, as I said, you know, same like with the thrust bearings, don't crank down on it. You just don't want to make sure that you know it's nice and yep, yeah, it's tight. Yep, yeah, that's tight. Yep, tight. Yep, that's tight. And like I said, I will go over every single screw from top to bottom, including the main rotor. Um, so uh, you've got bearings. Yep, give it a turn. Now you'll it'll move a little bit here, but yep, it's nice and tight. And you want to make sure that the blade grip screws. Yep. The control arms for the blade grips, yep, they're nice and tight. You want to make sure this is all tight. And like when I say don't crank down on it, because what can happen is you can strip the screws. And that is something that you don't want, obviously. So, and I will also go over the screws for the servos. And I will also check... If you have servos with metal uh, splines, you will want to check to make sure that they're all tight and there's no, because you, obviously, I know I'm sounding like a parrot, you don't want things to fail. So that is that part there. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to flip this around and I will go over the engine and fuel system. All right, so what I'm going to cover here is the fuel system and engine. Now, when it comes to nitro helicopters, this is something that shouldn't be overlooked, which obviously goes without saying, because, um, the an engine that runs poorly can cause uh, the helicopter to perform poorly obviously but um, if the engine is out of tune you can either if it's too rich or too lean you can have uh, issues mid-air now when it comes to the fuel line I will generally replace the fuel line once a year, Be especially uh, from like with me. If you're using a crimp here, like this, um, fuel silicon fuel tubing is fairly resilient. However, after a period of time of like crimping it down and so forth, it can get a little fatigued and um it can fuel it's not it doesn't last forever and it's something that shouldn't be overlooked as well as um fuel filters now i'm just running a simple fuel filter uh past the fuel crimp here fuel filters um ones like this one here um, can be disassembled and cleaned however for the amount of money that they cost it is uh, the benefit of replacing it it once a year outweighs um, just cleaning it because uh, like for instance I think this little filter here probably costs about four dollars Australian it's probably about two dollars seventy five in US currency just for reference um, so it's just honestly for peace of mind just get it along with the fuel tube and chuck it obviously 
uh, things like a uh, little T-piece here and the uh, little bung here, a little, a little plug, you know, you can keep that, but don't cheap out, just replace it because the last thing you want is a clogged fuel filter or any splits in the fuel line. And that goes for the fuel bit of fuel line that's in the uh, tank here. You will want to replace that as well. Um, like I said, generally once a year, just for peace of mind, um, because you don't want any damage done, uh, any or any damaged fuel tube. And generally, too, when you come home from flying or what I like to do when I, when I come home from flying is I will inspect the fuel tubing um, generally uh, what I'll do is I'll just have a f just have a visual inspection and look at it um, if I feel that the engine isn't running right um, no matter how much I adjust the mixture needles uh, what I will do is put the uh, fuel tubing under a bit of a pressure test and basically what I'll do is I'll pull pull the tubing off and into here I can blow I'll, I'll block off each end and I will blow into this and listen for any hissing noises uh, what I also might do is rub some soap, like uh, dishwashing soap, over the fuel tubing and see if any bubbles start to appear. And uh, if nothing, if there are any bubbles, well, obviously there is a split or a hole in the fuel tubing and I will replace it. So that is um, what I'll do with the fuel tubing. Um, Pressure tube um, not so isn't really so much. Uh, not a lot of attention is needed on it. Um, I will, however, like on the other side with the pipe, uh, because you know pipe gets hot, um, the pressure tube will get uh, brittle on the hot end into the pipe. So if need be, uh, either just snip a little bit off and then put a bit on. But I will replace it generally once a year, maybe two years, depending on the condition of the tube. Um, so that's what I will do with the fuel system. The next part um, is uh, with the engine. Now, with your engine, one of the most crucial parts for it is the glow plug. I have a new one here. I'm, uh, it's a little bit fiddly and finicky to get out because I've got to take leads off and so forth. Glow plugs, glow plugs. Sorry, I'm getting a bit tongue-tied here. Are very are a very important part of a nitro model because essentially you are relying on this small little plug here to keep the entire model in the air. Now I speak from experience um, you want a good quality glow plug I only run OS plugs um, for reference this is an OS number 8 you don't want to go cheap on plugs um, as I said, I speak from experience. I can't, I can't for the life of me what plug I was running, um, but I had a cheap plug in there because uh, I couldn't get any of these at the time. And I put one in. First couple of flights, it was all right. Um, but probably around the fourth, maybe fifth flight, the plug burnt out and I had to do my very first auto rotation with this model. Well, had to do my very first auto rotation ever. <laughs> and I can tell you it was a pucker factor of 10 out of 10. 
Um, I had, I'd had the, um, I've only had this model for a short period of time and, um, I changed the plug to this other plug. Like I said, I can't remember what it was, um, but it was the, around the equivalent, um, temperature rating as one of these, uh, OS number eights. And, um, fortunately it was about 10 feet off the ground, but it was going and the engine quit and yeah, I was puckered up real tight. So plugs are sent a very important. Now, when I come back from flying, I will take the plug out and I will inspect it because uh, your plug uh, has a platinum coil inside it and the that element uh, as time goes on that that coil starts to deteriorate and therefore your performance starts to drop and uh, you won't get good rpm you won't get good throttle response and it will quit on you now when it comes to replacing plugs personally for me i recommend between 12 to 15 flights depending on how hard you run your model as i said previously i'm not a 3d pilot so i don't go flat chat i'm not hard on it so the engine isn't working hard I just fly around casually so I'm um, between 12 and 15 flights I will take the plug out and I will replace it with a new one because this is as I said you're relying on this little plug to keep your model in the air so don't cheap out or get a decent quality plug or a good quality plug and don't get your money's worth out of it. Don't be stingy, guys. It's not worth... Trying to get as much uh, use out of it is not worth it because the benefit of replacing it at regular intervals is much better than having to replace an entire model because the engine quit and you, you, know, you could have been upside down doing or doing some aerobatics. So you don't want to have a plug fail on you guys. So now what we'll do is we'll go on to uh, the next part. All right guys, so the next part is blade inspection. Now this is relative for both main blades and tail blades. So with your blades, again, you're relying on these to keep your model in the air and you're relying on your tail rotor blades to stop it from spinning out of control. So with these blades, what I like to do is I'll just bring this a little bit closer. I'll just move that out of the way. One of the things I'll check is the leading edge of the blade. Um, I will check now before I carry on um, this can be done without with the blade off um, taken off the model um, but you can do you can inspect it while it is still attached um, so yeah what I will do is I will check the leading edge first and I'll run my finger along or my thumb whatever feels comfortable and I will check to see if anything is split I will run just to see, or see if there's any dam damage and like I said I don't fly my models hard so there's really there's not a lot I've had these blades these are the original blades that I put on this model so <laughs> that gives you an idea of how how long this will last but I'll also run my hands and fingers along there just to feel if anything is damaged and that's just some of the uh, 
decal or etching or whatever it might be um, and underneath as well what can happen um, apart from if you flying inverted and fly too low and the blade strikes the ground um, other things can be um, well in an extreme case you can have small birds um, attack your model trust me I've had um, small birds attack my model airplanes uh, at the flying field I've even had a uh, hawk <laughs> I've had hawks attack it but I've fortunately I've not had any birds attack my helicopters which is good but you could have small birds you can have um, other flying debris um, being uh, if you're flying close to the ground you can have small sticks and so forth hitting the blades generally you know they wouldn't damage the blades but in extreme cases it can happen so it's always good just to check and feel the blades see if there's any damage also too because um, you're relying on this bolt here to hold the blade to the blade grip um, you have a metal sleeve now give me a second guys I'll be back I'll have another blade with me all right I'm back I totally forgot I had some old blades uh, from my old uh, helicopter that I have um, just laying about so um, when it comes to the blades as I said check the leading edge check the top and underneath faces of the blades but also check to this area here so that area is right here that is where the blade grip clamps down and that is where and you as you can see you have a small uh, metal sleeve that goes through you want to inspect that to see if that is loose or damaged um, because over a period of time with the blades spinning the forces of it of uh, like the blades the G forces of it swinging outwards but you got the changes in, in pitch and so forth after a period of time that can create stress and damage so always check the uh, part the little sleeve area there too um, so that's basically it for um, the blades and that and like I said this is relative to your tail rotor blades so that uh, just a little bit of little inspection can go a long way all right so one of the last things I will do um, when it comes to inspecting the model is the I will inspect the airframe now the air for um, not all models are built the same have the same components and same materials and so forth uh, this model has a carbon fiber frame now carbon fiber apart from being an electrical conductor carbon fiber especially this particular uh, carbon fiber it's woven uh, carbon fiber it is layered so to get so this is about two millimeters thick this uh this side frame here so to get that it's layered and it's epoxied and then in the factory it's uh, milled out and so forth so what happens is uh when it's milled out the edges are porous so in other words it can absorb moisture so when I've built when I um, this is a bit of a habit from uh, racing radio control cars uh, especially with nitro powered cars and with off-road models um, with carbon fiber I always went around the edges with uh, thin CA to seal the edges now 
with a nitro helicopter I recommend if you're a first time builder to do this before you start assembling it because especially like with around the fuel tank and you got fuel line here you don't want uh, fuel being absorbed into the airframe because what can happen is the carbon fiber can delaminate and when it delaminates it becomes weaker and if you're flying aerobatics it can um, well the frame can start to split and get uh, fatigued and then like a parrot it can crash so check your go around like what I do after flying is I'll get my fingernail and I'll feel it feel if there's any delamination of any kind and so forth especially around the engine and fuel tank area like I said it's porous and with um, with your fuel you have oil and that can get in and seep in and create damage or cause damage so that is something you want to keep an eye out for guys um, but like I said with the thin CA glue going around the edges and on the inside and so forth that just seals the edges and you're less likely to have any issues all right guys so we've come to the last part here so this last part is all about lubrication now lubrication is very important and I don't want to I know I sound like a parrot repeating this but doing this will prevent catastrophic damage done to your helicopter lubrication makes things work better and all moving parts require lubrication now I have heard it said that with nitro models not a lot of lubrication is required because the exhaust uh, being recirculated through the blades goes through the gears and so on and so forth I mean that's all very well and good however to each their own I prefer to use I prefer to physically lubricate the moving parts myself now I only use as you can see here two forms of lubrication I have some oil and I have some grease now for record this is fishing reel grease uh, fishing reel oil and it's called sure catch super gear oil now um, I like to use that because it is a thicker viscosity than your general light machine oil that you may get and this here is Tamiya anti-wear grease or Tamiya AW grease I like to use these because I've in my experience and my opinion I find that these work the best um, some people might have a disagreement that is totally fine everyone is entitled to their opinion however I highly recommend especially on gears whether it's uh, main gears or uh, if your if your models like mine and it has um, a torque tube or shaft driven tail rotor I strongly recommend this stuff because it is very very sticky and uh, you can get it either in one of these little uh, little uh, little containers like this or you can get it in a tube I can't find my tube so I've just got this here for um, visual purposes um, but like I said it is really sticky stuff um, don't have an itchy nose if you have some of this on your fingers and the reason why I like to use this stuff because I did start to use um, like a white lithium grease it worked however at speed it just flung off and 
um, like you can see like remnants of it still left on the main gear here um, it like I said it just flung off and the same with the gear for the um, tail rotor it flung off so I cleaned I cleaned up the other gears as much as I could but what I've done is don't know if you can see it too well but you can see the slight silvery shine on the gears now that grease has been on there for months I have not had to re-grease the gears but I visually inspect it to make sure that it is fine but this grease sticks really well to the gears. Now, you can just see some of it on the sides of the gear here. And if I just carefully wipe it, you can just see a little bit, it's a bit hard to see, but you can see some of it's wiped off. This grease, like I said, has been on for months. But I will always check it after I come home from flying to make sure that it, it is ad adequately greased. But this stuff sticks to the gears really well. And like you, I also use it on the tail rotor gear here. Um, you probably can't see the shine too well. Oh, there you go. You can see a bit of the shine. That's the grease on the gears. That grease, because that like for instance that tail rotor is spinning at a few thousand rpm and the lithium grease that I tried before just flung off whereas this Tamiya anti-wear grease just stay just stays on to the gears it doesn't fling off the only trade-off I could possibly come think of with that grease is that it uh, like especially around the tail rotor area you could get some grass stick to it i haven't had that happen but it can happen so just inspect it and it should be good with this um gear oil here like i said it is um fishing reel oil however like i said it's a thicker viscosity so it does stick to moving parts a bit better than light machine oil so what I'll do I mean I've still got the cap on but just for visual purposes I'll go over majority of the moving parts or most of the moving parts and put a bit of oil on it so for instance here on with the blade grips you've got holes here they're oiling holes so I'll put a bit on in there and I'll give it a squeeze push some oil down in there for the thrust bearings and the other bearings I will go through all the linkages and so forth it can it it does fling off a little bit on on the on the rotor that parts that spin um, it is inevitable you got is it centrifugal force or centrifugal force I can't remember but the the force of it spinning will cause it to come off which is inevitable um but you know on all the parts put just a little bit not you don't have to drown it just a little bit um oil the shaft there's a bearing down in there put a bit of oil on there any bearings so you got bearing there you got you know joints there bearings on the tail rotor so a little bit of oil like i said you don't have to drown it just a little bit and that is what I will do after every uh, flying session and after I come home. So, uh, so that's basically what I do. So guys, that's pretty much it. That is what I go through, and I like I won't I won't lie. It is quite time consuming. Um, it might take me a couple of hours to go over all of this to make sure it's fine but like I say it is this sort of maintenance can mean the difference between a good flying helicopter and a helicopter that will fly poorly and most likely will crash and like I said the if a model crashes 
There is a possibility that it can cause uh, personal injury or injury to others. And that is something that you don't want. So guys, take if you've got a nitro helicopter or you're getting into this hobby, don't don't uh, don't take don't take maintenance lightly. This is some like this is a, a model like this is a big investment, and to have it crash, you know, a lot of time and money has gone into building it and learning to fly. So take the time to do some maintenance, preventative maintenance, and routine changes of of parts. Don't don't take it lightly, guys. So. If you've liked this video, I hope, well, I hope you like this video, guys. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to comment down below. I'll do my best to uh, get get to your questions, and I'll do my best to answer them to the best of my abilities. Until then, guys, happy flying, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.